Welcome back to the channel. Uh, we'll talk a bit about axes today. It's a really nice morning today, uh, except for all of the gnats flying around. But other than that, it's a nice morning. So I thought I'd start out here in the woods on this particular topic. And I'm going to start with anatomy. I think knowing the parts of the axe is pretty important. So that's where we're going to start. And I'm going to use this Grants vs. Brook small forest axe as a prop to show the different parts. The first thing I'm going to do is take the mask off and get that out of the way so we can see everything. And there we go. Nice little axe there. The wooden part, of course, is the handle. That's pretty well common knowledge, I think. It's also referred to as a haft or a hill. The metal part, again, pretty common knowledge, is the head. Where the handle goes through the head is known as the eye here. And you can see the exposed wood at the top of the eye, just so. Between the eye and the cutting edge in this region here, we have the cheek. The cutting edge is referred to as the bit. The top of the bit, opposite of the handle, is known as the toe. The bottom, on the same end as the handle, is known as the heel. Between the heel of the toe and the eye or the handle in this region here, you have the beard. At the bottom of the eye where it meets the handle, you have these ears or lugs. Um, main purpose for those is just to get a, a bit of extra uh, attachment between the head and the handle. Gives a bit extra strength, things like that. Uh, it also, in a way, serves as a bit of a collar, perhaps. Uh, just kind of protects that region right below the eye, because uh, that is generally the weakest point on the handle. Behind the eye, opposite of the bit, have the pole. Uh, you may have heard of a pole axe or a pole axe, and pretty much all that refers to is an axe that has a pole. Moving down onto the handle, uh, you can see this little bump right here. Uh, and on a lot of axes, this one doesn't show it, but on a lot of axes you may see a reduction in the size of the handle between uh, this part down here and where it goes into the eye. It'll have a, a really pronounced transition point and that's referred to as the shoulder. This particular handle has a really curved serpentine shape. Uh, that's pretty common on most modern axes. Um, you may see some that are straight, but for the most part you'll see to some degree that serpentine shape going through there with the nice curves. Down here at the bottom, uh, a lot of people will refer, the, refer to that as a palm swell. Uh, I kind of like the older term of a fawn's foot. Um, this one is flattened off here at the top, but if you were to look at an old axe uh, from back when the fawn's foot was first introduced, you would see that the back of the handle would come up like so, and would come out, a bit at, hmm, come out at an angle like that, if I can talk, and come to a pretty sharp point. And if you look at one of those and isolate the end of the handle, it really does look quite like a deer's foot, so fawn's foot. Uh, one other point that I didn't mention uh, this region of the handle on the same side as the pole that's referred to as the back. The side on the same as the bit is the belly. So, there's anatomy pretty well taken care of pretty quickly. And now I'm going to put the mask back on this little guy so I can carry it out of the woods safely, covered up. And I'm going to head down to the shop. I've got some axes laid out on a bench down there and we're going to look at those, talk about how I break down different sizes of axes into categories, um, some different features of axes, uh, how I go about sizing an axe to myself, uh, things like that. So stick around, it'll only be a second for you, and I'm going to head down to the shop and we'll take a look at that stuff. So we made it down to the shop. I've got axes laid out here on the table, as you saw just a second ago in that little video run. Uh, before I get into breaking down axes into size groups, which is going to be the next thing, I dug this one out. As I mentioned, the beard on the first part of the video, and there you can really see that pronounced beard coming down. This is a bearded axe, so there you go. 
Now then, when it comes to breaking down axes into size categories or size classifications, uh, there are usually four that I go with. Uh, the first would be a hatchet or a belt axe. The next would be a pack axe or a trapper's axe or something like that. Uh, the next one would be a camp axe or a boy's axe. And the final one would be a full size axe or a felling axe. So for a hatchet or a belt axe, um, I'm probably going to go with something not a whole lot bigger than this one right here. Uh, this is a Holtzbrook All Night Hatchet. Uh, for me, I'm thinking probably nothing more than 16 inches long on the handle and no more than a pound and a half, maybe a pound and three quarters on the head, but probably a pound and a half at the maximum. Uh, the reason for those two uh, numbers, much more than 16 inches on the handle and it starts to whack me in the back of the leg while I'm walking or I get it caught on my calf. Don't really like that and much more than a pound and a half on the head and it starts to drag the belt down pretty good so it's more of a convenience and carrying kind of thing more than anything so uh, this one is pretty well perfect for carrying on a belt I uh, think this is a 16 inch handle and it has a one pound head uh, lots you can do with this very convenient to carry uh, another option that's really comfortable to carry on the belt is this little bitty guy right here uh, don't remember the exact model for this. This is made by Grants First Brook. I'll put the model up on the screen. Uh, but this is very, very comfortable to carry. Uh, this is actually this is the, the smallest one that I have in my collection. Uh, and it kind of pretty well shows what might have been called a pocket axe uh, back in the first part of the 20th century. Uh, back when uh, people like Horace Kephart and Francis H. Buzzacott People like that were writing books about the outdoors, camping, woodcraft, all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you look up a marble's pocket axe, it's very popular with campers and woodsmen, and hunters, things like that, just because it's so portable. Um, actually, way further back in history than the early part of the 20th century, in fact. Uh, back in medieval times, something like this would probably have been fairly commonplace for travelers uh, carrying one of these in lieu of a belt knife. Uh, I personally have used this to do all kinds of bushcrafty things uh, without even getting a knife out. So it's a very, very useful tool, very small, and oftentimes more useful than a large knife if you're carrying a large knife for chopping, right? Because this is, after all, a hatchet. So works really well. Uh, let's see here. The next size up would be camp axe, or excuse me, a pack axe, or a trapper's axe, a voyager's axe, expedition axe, or if you want to use the modern term of a bushcraft axe. Alright, let's see here. So here is a Snow and Neely Hudson Bay. Really good example of this size of axe. Uh, for me, I'm probably going to go with um, no more than about 20, maybe 22 inches on the handle length and probably no more than two pounds on the head. Uh, the purpose of something like this for me would be winter camping, uh, extended stays in the woods of more than a day or two, uh, where I feel like I'm gonna need to process a lot of firewood, if I'm gonna be building some type of permanent or semi-permanent structure out in the woods, this is the kind of tool I'm gonna take along for that. Uh, this is actually fairly similar to some drawings and things that I've seen from uh, 18th century trappers and things like that up around the Great Lakes area and places like that. And if we compare that to what I had previously up in the woods, the Grants First Brook Small Forest Axe, really similar, right? Really similar head profile, really similar bit length, fairly similar handle length really similar weight on the head as well. So, things have not changed all that much throughout time, which is kind of interesting. Uh, what worked then still works today. So, uh, let's see here. Here's another one that I wanted to show. This is a Plum National Pattern. 
Um, and these were quite popular uh, with Boy Scouts and things like that uh, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, this head pattern is quite popular on, on scout axes and scout hatchets. Uh, really nice cutting profile. If you look at the thickness of the cheeks, it's extremely, extremely thin. Um, this will bite incredibly well into a piece of wood. Splitting is not one of its strong suits, but chopping does a really good job. Next size up would be the uh, camp axe or the boys axe. And for that, I'm going to get this one out right here. This is the Holtzbrook uh, Agdor Montreal 28, I believe. Uh, these are still currently produced. Really good axes. Um, for this size classification of a camp axe or a boys axe, I'm probably going to go with nothing more than 28 inches on the handle and not a whole lot more than two and a half, two and three quarter pounds on the head, something like that. Uh, something heavy enough that it'll bite pretty deep, um, long enough handle I can get a good swing to split some wood, all that kind of stuff. Uh, just a basic utility axe. Uh, around homestead, around a base camp, something like that where I'm not going to be carrying an axe all the time but I'm also not going to be felling a lot of trees something like this for me is really perfect tool uh, carrying a pickup for cutting out trees been there done that with this one actually um, really good size utility axe the next size up then is going to be the full size axe and for that I'm going to get this one right here which is my favorite felling axe. I have no idea who made it. It's old. It's not marked anywhere, but I really like this one, so I wanted to show it. Full-size felling axe for me is going to be anything more than 28 inches on the handle and three pounds or more on the head. I tend to go with shorter handles regardless of head weight uh, just because of the kind of woods that I tend to go out and chop wood in. Uh, kind of brushy, things like that, and I like to have a little bit shorter handle uh, just so I don't need as much room to swing without worrying about getting caught on tree branches and things like that. Uh, this is, I believe, a 32 inch handle, uh, 31, 32, somewhere in there, which is a really good size, uh, but for going out in the woods and doing a lot of work around brush, this is actually just a little bit long. Uh, for my preference. Um, using around the house, dropping trees, this is going to be one of my top two picks. But like I mentioned, in brushy areas, I might would go with something a little bit more like this one, which has a little bit shorter handle. I believe this is probably about a 28 or thereabouts, and it's a three and a half pound head. So this is a really good brush axe, uh, if you want to use that term. But it is still classified by me as a full-size axe. So, uh, that's how I tend to break down axes into size categories. So as far as choosing an axe, right, there are a few things that I like to keep in mind. The first is what you're going to use it for. Uh, are you going to be felling a lot of large trees? Are you going to be using it camping? Are you going to be using it to cut kindling around your fireplace? Is it going to go in your vehicle for in case there's a tree across the road? Right? Are you going to be splitting with it? Like, what's the purpose? So that's one thing to consider. Once you've figured out what you're going to use it for, there are some other considerations that I like to look at. Uh, and these are things that I use personally and uh, if someone asks my advice on how to choose an axe, uh, these, are, these are things that I would tell them. So we'll start with the largest axe, right? And I'm going to I'm going to use this one as an example, um, just because it's easy. Um, when it comes to choosing an axe, it's important to keep your physical limitations in mind, uh, and that is that includes your height, how long your arms are, uh, how strong you are, all those things, right? Um, and the first thing to figure out is how long the handle you want, how long is comfortable. 
Uh, but once you've got that figured out, figuring out the weight of the head, it, I think is, is a really important thing. Uh, having a head that's too heavy uh, kind of reduces your control, reduces efficiency during use, uh, reduces your accuracy, all those sorts of things. If you have a head that's just too heavy for you. And a way that I like to use to figure out whether or not a head is too heavy is for the largest category of axes is to hold it from the end like so and hold it straight out in front of you at full arm's length just like that and if you can hold it like that uh, that's probably going to be pretty good weight for you uh, next test would be to pick it up using just your wrist no elbow movement or anything like that just a wrist and be honest with yourself about that if it if it feels hard to do go down a little bit there's nothing wrong with that um, I personally consider someone who abides by their own limitations and knows what those are and abides by them to be much more conscientious and I would be much more likely to want to work with them in the woods uh, just because they're okay with not using the biggest axe that they can find. Um, and I am right this moment using this very small axe. I have injuries on my arms that limit my ability to use an axe at the moment. so. I'm not doing the test with those because they're heavy and I'm not comfortable with that. So I'm abiding by my own limitations at the moment. Uh, the next category down would be the utility axe. Right, one thing to think about is the handle length. Right? One way to test that, uh, figure out what a good length for you is on that size axe of a, a camp axe or maybe a large pack axe if you want to kind of combine the two categories is to hold the head like so, place it under your arm, place the handle under your arm. The handle, uh, I'll hold it like that so I can hold it up. Most, most people that use this technique, rule of thumb would be that the handle should just meet inside your armpit. Wait, this one's a little short, obviously. Uh, for me, that's usually about 24 to 25 inches, works out really well. Um, you know, if you hold it straight out like that, that's good. I kind of like to come down just a hair below completely horizontal, down to about right there. For me, that's about perfect on handle length for that utility axe size. Once you've figured out the handle length, next to figure out the head weight, I like to hold the hand handle again from the bottom, but rather than holding it out this way, hold it out horizontally in front so that head's in front of one shoulder, handles in front of the other, right? Just like so. And if you can hold that, um, you probably will have really good control of that axe and you'll be able to use that axe for a really long time. Uh, for the smallest categories, that's pretty much personal preference. But for the larger ones, I like to use those rules uh, or those techniques to, to choose handle length and head weight. Um, a lot of people will say that a heavier axe or a larger axe will do more work. And that is true to some degree, um, but you also have to think about how long are you going to want to use that axe, right? Um, if you can hold a four and a half pound axe at full arm extension, you'll probably be able to do a lot of work with that. But are you going to be tired after 20 minutes of using that? Whereas if you had a three and a half pound head, you could use it for three or four hours, right? Things to keep in mind. Uh, the largest axe that you can use is not necessarily what you need to use. Uh, there's nothing wrong with going down in size. Um, being able to use it longer uh, will increase the efficiency of that tool too. Because uh, if you can use it without being tired, your accuracy and precision in placing cuts will be much greater. So. Just a few things to keep in mind there on sizing an axe to yourself. And now uh, I want to go through and just kind of pick some of these out uh, and talk about some interesting characteristics they have, uh, some features of the heads, things like that. So that's next up is cool stuff about these axes. So this is the first interesting axe that I want to show because there is no pole. Right, I mentioned the pole earlier. Uh, the beginning of this video and you can see if you look at the back of this axe it is completely round there is no flat portion or anything on there 
Uh, this is a Collins Legitimus South American Trade Axe. Um, the interesting thing for me about this is it is not that old. Uh, most axes that don't have a pole would be from uh, prior to the mid 19th century, let's say. Uh, this one is probably from the mid 20th century. So it's not nearly as old as most axes without a pole, but I find that interesting. Uh, should mention the purpose of the pole. Right, so there, are, there are two kind of ideas around why the pole is, is there. The first is to use as a hammer, because uh, it is flat and you can't hammer with it. Uh, the second is to provide a counterbalance during swing, right, during use. Uh, with this axe, all of the weight is in front of the handle. Right? It's all in the cheek, all in the bit. It's all out this way. On an axe like this, there is considerable weight on the other side of the handle. It keeps it more balanced in flight. Um, I say in flight, meaning during a swing. Um, with something like this, as you swing it, uh, you may notice there's a bit of a, of a kind of a wavery action that goes on because it'll kind of flop just a little bit. Um, not like a cartoon or anything like that, but you will notice a little bit of, of an unsteady swing with an axe like this. Um, kind of interesting. Let's look at another one here. So I showed my favorite felling axe earlier. I'll just get that one out again. And if you look at the cheeks here, you'll see these indentations right there. And hopefully you'll be able to see that. I'm going to move it so light catches it. I have a high section here with a line that runs back onto the side of the eye and these indentations on the top and bottom of the cheek. Those are called phantom bevels. And the original purpose of that was to uh, cut down on the wedging action when the axe sticks into a piece of wood. Uh, on a completely flat cheek like this one, right, if you look that is completely flat uh, it's a little bit higher in the middle than it is on the top and bottom of the cheek, but it's fairly flat. Well, something like that, when you stick it in a piece of wood, there is a tendency for it to stick. Right? Where you got to kind of whack it and pull on it to get it back out. Phantom bevels were put in to give a bit of air space in there to reduce that suction effect, which is what holds the axe into the wood, essentially. So this is uh, a very early... Uh, iteration of those phantom bevels being implemented there and you can see this center section is a lot high, uh, a lot wider than on the, uh, the one I just showed and the indentation is much deeper right so as axe production moved along um, you now the the techniques got a little bit more refined things like that uh, people figured out a better way to make the head uh, in such a way that the cheeks don't stick quite as much. Uh, those phantom bevels just kind of hung around more as an aesthetic more than anything. Uh, they don't serve a huge purpose on modern axes, um, but on these there is somewhat of a notice noticeable difference during use uh, just because of the way the axes were manufactured when the phantom bevels were first introduced. So those are kind of cool. Uh, and you can see uh, this one here. This is a double bit. This a uh, True Temper Kelly Perfect double bit. And you can see those phantom bevels and they're much shallower than the one I just showed you. And much narrower uh, transition line there from the front of the cheek to the eye more aesthetic than anything, but it looks really cool, I must say. I am a fan of the Phantom Bevels. Uh, let's see here, here's another double bit I wanted to show, a much smaller one. This is a cruiser axe, or a cruising axe. Uh, something like this would have been used back in the, the logging days when people cut down trees with axes and not chainsaws. Uh, a cruiser would go through and essentially check the timber. Right, uh, see what is 
marketable, what's worth harvesting, things like that. And something like this, um, I've also heard the term of a sounding axe, uh, go through and strike a tree, listen to the sound, see if it's hollow, see if it's solid, and figure out whether or not that tree is, is worth harvesting, if it's worth any money. Uh, the more trees that are hollow, the less that piece of ground is worth in terms of timber harvest, right? So, useful tool back in back in the day. Let's see here. Um, here is a Jersey pattern axe, and this one may actually be uh, more like a Philadelphia Jersey. Uh, get this one out because there are many many patterns of axes and there are many many patterns of axes that look very similar right jersey philadelphia jersey uh kentucky virginia north carolina they can all look rather similar there are differences uh, such as the height of the pole the height of the bit uh, the difference in the height of the pole versus the bit uh, if you see something that the, the pole is maybe more like this that might be a virginia pattern or a kentucky pattern perhaps um, the shape of the lugs will also tell you something. So this looks quite a bit like it could be some version of Virginia pattern. This is actually a rockaway pattern. Those lugs are rounded rather than pointed as they are here. So there's a lot that goes into axe patterns. Um, you could write entire books on the subject, but I find it rather interesting, so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, one more thing I want to point out before I end the video. Let me get this one out here, is the tomahawk. Uh, tomahawks are quite useful tools. You can see a very, very thin bit. They chop incredibly well. Um, and my head is loose. Uh, chop incredibly well, but splitting maybe isn't one of their best uh, features. Very, very light, however, and also easy to pack. You saw the, the head was loose. You could put one of these in a pack obviously with the with the bit covered. Put one of those in a pack. It's very little weight. Uh, when you get out in the woods, you can just take a knife or this on its own, cut a handle, and just put a handle in it right out in the woods. So, uh, really convenient woods tools. Uh, if you're looking to cut weight or you hate to go out in the woods without an ax, but you don't really think you're gonna use it, Tomahawk might be a good option. So, uh, those are just a few interesting things um, about some of these axes. Um, hopefully that was interesting for you. I uh, hope you got something out of this video from the anatomy and, and all of that. Well, with that, uh, thank you for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. hope you found something useful in here. Maybe you learned something. That would be awesome. Uh, if you did enjoy it, I would definitely appreciate liking, sharing, subscribing, doing all the YouTube things. Uh, leave a comment down below. Um, That'll be awesome. We'll have a conversation. It'll be a good time. Um, but yeah, uh, until next time, uh, have a good one. Uh, go look at some axes and have a good time. Uh, and uh, see you next time.